Hello, thank you so much for showing up for this session. This is the ninth and final session in the systematic review seminar series. My name is Tom Herod, and the topic of this session is going to be writing a manuscript and getting published. So let me the next slide. So this is an outline of uh, where we've been so far in this series. The idea was generally that we uh, move sequentially through the process of performing a systematic review. And now we are on the final uh, stage in that, which is writing a manuscript and getting published. So as with all the prior sessions, this is a brief session and it's, I'm only going to cover a few of the key points uh, that, uh, that would be pertinent to this, but things that come up uh, regularly. So let's go ahead and jump in. The two main things I want to talk about are the return of Prisma. So Prisma is something we talked about earlier on in this series. So Prisma is the preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta analyses. Um, I'm going to talk about that a little bit and then how to go about choosing a journal. I'll walk through that process a little bit too. So let's go ahead into Prisma. So I talked about Prisma in the second session of this series because it's one of the most uh, commonly cited, commonly used uh, uh, kind of bits of guidance for performing a systematic review. Um, in fact, let's just go ahead there. So I'm going to click on the link and go to the Prisma 2020 checklist, which is the most current. Say open and it is a 27 plus item checklist. So you'll see a lot of the items have multiple sub items. So it's 27 plus, I don't know, 35, 40 items, whatever it is. Um, and these are the things as you're writing a manuscript that you should consider or you, that you should include and discuss. And it goes through the typical layout of a journal article, title, abstract, introduction, etc. And for each of those sections talks about things you should be sure to include. Um, and in fact, a lot of journals actually require you to fill out one of these checklists saying where in the manuscript each of these items shows up and you submit that with your manuscript. And in a lot of, in a large percentage of published systematic reviews, if you look in their methods sections, you'll see they specifically say, we follow the Prisma checklist. Um, so this is a very common thing in the world of systematic reviews and it's very helpful Number one, as I mentioned earlier in the series, when you're planning a systematic review, it's helpful to be uh, knowledgeable about this because you can't report something if you haven't done it. So when you're developing your protocol for a systematic review, you'd want to be familiar with this. And it's helpful at the, the tail end of the process when you're writing up the manuscript because it'll guide you in terms of what you ought to be sure to include. Um, so Prisma is, the Prisma checklist is very helpful in that regard. Um, however, there's not just the Prisma checklist for systematic reviews, they've written Prisma variations for other types of reviews. So in this one, this is Prisma for scoping reviews. So click on the PDF and it's a fillable PDF. This one only has 22 items because there's things that you would commonly do in a systematic review that you don't often do in a scoping review, so the checklist is shorter. Um, but there is a scoping review version of this. The other thing from Prisma is the flow diagram, which if you've had any exposure to systematic reviews, you've almost certainly seen one of these. If I click on this, another Word document, it is a chart that is almost ubiquitous within systematic reviews of showing how many articles you found, how many you screened of those, how many you retrieved, how many you assessed for eligibility, etc. Um, again, you'll almost certainly be asked to submit a Prisma flow diagram when you write up a manuscript for a, a systematic review. So that's where that comes from. Um, so those are some of the resources that can help you in writing up a manuscript. So to know what you ought to include in it, ideally. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is choosing a journal. <coughs> Excuse me. And so when choosing a journal, that you want to submit to. Um, well, let me take a step back. So for people who are very knowledgeable in a field, they may have a sense of where they want to submit. For folks who are newer to a field, this may be more difficult. Um, 
So there's tools, though, that can help you. And this is something we work with students and faculty a lot. Um, so here's some questions that you would want to consider when choosing a journal. So do they even publish on my topic? Do they publish systematic reviews? What's the quality of the journal? Not just a number, like an impact factor, but what's its ranking within its field? And then what are the guidelines that the journal has for submitting a manuscript? So I'm going to go ahead and look at an example here. So I'm going to go to the Himmelfarb webpage, so himmelfarb.gwu.edu, and I'm going to use this database called Scopus. Click on Scopus, and I'm going to do a search. Let's say I'm writing a manuscript for a systematic review on diabetes. What I can do is look for other uh, systematic reviews on diabetes. So that's what I'm going to do here. So a couple things. When I put the terms here, it's searching in the titles, abstract keywords, that's too broad for me. I want to make this more specific. I want the word diabetes to show up in the title of the article. I want to really specify systematic reviews that are about diabetes, not just ones that mention it in the abstract. Again, I want articles where the phrase systematic review shows up in the title. And this takes advantage of, to take a step back to Prisma, the very first item in the 27 item checklist is to uh, clearly identify your article as a systematic review. And so the way most people do that is they include the phrase systematic review in the title. So a systematic review of blah, 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 or blah, 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 a systematic review. Um, so I can take advantage of that when I'm searching for systematic reviews by saying, show me articles that have this phrase in the title. So I'm going to go ahead and search. And there are 4,105 in Scopus that meet these criteria, the, that diabetes and the phrase systematic review are in the title. What's unique or what's really helpful about a tool like um, Scopus is I can scroll down here and see the source title. So of the 4,100 articles, here are the most commonly represented journals among those articles. So 160 of the 4,100 are in this journal, Diabetes Research and Clinical Practice. So this is a way, and I can say view all. It'll show me the whole list of all of them, I think down to um, every any journal that has four or more. But it's a, a gigantic list here of potential journals. And what's useful about doing this is it answers yes to those first two questions. Does the journal uh, publish articles about diabetes? Yes, because I know that. Do they publish artic uh, articles that are systematic reviews? Yes, because that's the way I defined this search was both of those concepts had to be included. So to be included, you have to answer yes, basically, to those first two questions. But that's step one. That's the identification of candidate journals. So what I might do is pick a list of journals and then do some more research on them. So I'm going to pick one of them here and kind of show you what the research process looks like. So I'm going to pick PLOS1, PLOS1. And I want more information about PLOS1. So there's two databases I'm going to go to to find out more about PLOS1. Uh, Go to all databases, so Himmelfarb website, all databases, and the letter J for journal citation reports. This is the first database I'm going to go to to get more information about PLOS One. So I go there, I type in PLOS One, and it will match to the journal right here. Click on that. And if I scroll down, I can get the impact factor for the journal, the 2020 impact factor. So keep in mind that, and this, this, we get this question all the time, well, what's the 2021 impact factor? Well, they haven't calculated that yet, even though we're just weeks away from 2022. 2020 is the most recent impact factor. It takes a long time to calculate these, so there's always this kind of delay. So 3.24. Problem is, is that good? Is that bad? How do I know? You know, impact factors, for those who may be familiar with them, you know that they're very field dependent. You know, what's a really good impact factor for a math journal may be a not so good impact factor for an immunology journal. However, I can scroll down and get more context for that number. So scroll down. 
and they will rank impact factor within categories. So they've categorized PLOS One as a multidisciplinary sciences journal. And among the 72 journals that they've identified as multidisciplinary sciences, PLOS One has the 26th highest impact factor. So that gives me a sense at least of how it ranks within its field. Um, so that's some of the information I can get from journal citation reports, the impact factor and then its ranking within its field. Um, the other thing that I can do is go to a, another article or another database, sorry, all databases from Himmelfarb and go to the letter U and Ulrichs. Uh, and again, I'm going to put in the name of the journal because I want more information about this journal. FOSS1. Here's the record for it. And I can see number one, it's a peer reviewed journal because this little icon here, which is a football referee's jersey that shows up next to it. So that means it's peer reviewed. So I'm going to click on that. And um, a couple pieces of information, or one that I really like from uh, Ulrich is to know where that journal is indexed. So which article databases index that journal because that tells me how findable my article is going to be. So if I know what are the most commonly used article databases within my field, I can see if those databases index this journal because that means if someone searches that database later on after my article has been published, there's a chance they'll find my article if they use the right search terms. So here's this list of abstracting and indexing databases. So if I go down this, I would look for, you know, what are the most important ones? So there's a lot of ones here. Uh, pig news and information, that was a new one for me. Um, I guess a database about pig articles. Um, anyway, so keep scrolling. Uh, so Web of Science, it's covered in Web of Science, so that's good because that's one that uh, folks definitely use in the sciences and biomedical sciences. Embase and Scopus, those are very important. So those, if someone looks in one of those databases, they should be able to find my article. Um, Medline, obviously very important that it be indexed in Medline. So you'd want to look through this list for key databases in your field uh, to make sure that the journal that you're submitting to is covered with is indexed within those databases. The last thing is to get information about um, uh, the author requirements, and for what for that, I typically will just uh, Google it. So, plus one author requirements. I always that's always my phrasing. Whatever the journal is, author requirements. And I will be sent to a page like this, Submission Guidelines. And I can get a sense of the format, the length, the fonts, all that stuff. But if I do a Control F, I can look if they have specific guidance on performing systematic reviews. And I know PLOS One does um, right here. So consult the following for additional guidance. PLOS One Guidelines for Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. So I click on that and it tells me it tells me that I should submit a Prisma checklist and flow diagram when I submit my manuscript. That's what we just talked about. Um, so it gives me you know, the general formatting rules for that journal, but also if there are any specific systematic review formatting or considerations. Um, so that would be how I would go about answering these questions. And then hopefully through that process, I could identify an appropriate journal to which I would submit my manuscript. So, in conclusion, talked about Prisma and finding the right journal. So some concluding thoughts for this entire series. Uh, so systematic reviews are difficult and time consuming, but they represent art, but systematic reviews are articles that are among the highest level of evidence available. So there's, you know, there, that's why people do them, even though they're so difficult and time consuming. Performing one means following well-established protocols. Um, and so that is very helpful. So you know, because it entering the world of systematic reviews can be very daunting. And so at least you know there's a lot of good guidance. And we talked about that in earlier sessions, the Cochrane Handbook, the JBI Handbook, Prisma. Um, third point here is systematic reviews employ methods to minimize bias and ensure transparency. Um, 
And so one of the ways they do that is the point here that systematic reviews are a team sport. So you ought to have a team of people working on your systematic review. One of the reasons, main reasons for that is to minimize bias so that when you're, you have two independent voters selecting the journal or the articles for consideration. So it's a way of minimizing bias. But moving beyond just systematic reviews, there are other types of reviews that use similar methodologies, for instance, scoping reviews. So a systematic review is typically meant to answer a particular question. Um, a scoping review can be used to describe the literature around a particular topic. So the methodologies are similar, but the outcomes are different. Um, and contact a librarian. So myself and a lot of my colleagues, we work with a lot of folks uh, on performing systematic reviews. And it's something that many of us have had specialized training in and we can help people uh, work on systematic reviews. So feel free to contact us uh, for help on that. So with that, I'm going to end this session and I want to thank you for your attention and uh, have a good day.